Leader Thayer, thank you for coming over uh, during this busy first day, uh, not necessarily maybe so much in your chamber, but in the House chamber. There's a lot of activity today. Um, so Happy New Year to you and thank you. Happy New Year, Renee. I'm always happy to come on any of your shows. Thank you. And appreciate everything that KET does to bring the news of the legislative session to its viewers across Kentucky. Well, 60 days this time. It's a budget session, uh, no special session on pension reform as many had anticipated. Perhaps we had, had been signaled that it would be. So will that be the first issue that's tackled and will that be the main thing you keep the focus on the first couple of weeks as Senator Bowen has intimated before? Yes, we, we need to focus on getting a strong pension bill passed as soon as possible and obviously I would have liked it to have been done in a special session that didn't happen I would like that we could have tackled it right away right away this week that's probably not gonna happen but I think it needs to be done this month before we know how to proceed on the budget I'm hopeful that we can get some immediate savings from a pension bill by dealing with items that are outside the inviolable contract mm -hmm for teachers and other public sector employees so that the cuts to the budget that are likely to occur will be lessened by those pension cost reductions. Many people were surprised the governor's budget reduction order was only 1.3 percent and I think perhaps maybe any, many other agencies were preparing for much more catastrophic <clears throat> cuts for the fiscal year that ends June 30th of 2018. Uh, so let's talk about that. Do you think that's fair? And, and how will that impact when you go into making the budget what the 2018-2020 budget will look like? Will those cuts be much, much, much deeper with or without pension reform? I think we're going to have cuts, uh, pretty significant cuts, no matter what. I think they will be deep if we pass a pension bill, but I think they will be deeper if we don't pass a pension bill where we can get some immediate savings. Yeah. Uh, Two billion dollars perhaps uh, that's needed for the pension systems, is that still a correct number? Over the course of the biennium, it's, it's about a billion dollars a year. If you remember two years ago... That's like a tithe. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, 10% it of, it of the biennial it is, budget. It is a biblical tithe. Mm-hmm. 10% of the budget on top of the base that we're already putting in because we increased the base two years ago to 1.2 billion correct at Governor Bevin's suggestion we put 1.2 billion dollars extra into pensions and from all accounts we're going to need an additional billion dollars billion with a B on top of that in order to meet our obligations and we are determined to meet our obligations it's part of the long-term solution to getting us out of this deep hole we have dug ourselves into. So where is the bill now? There has been a bill that's drafted and we're waiting on a score from the Kentucky Teachers Retirement System. We hope to have that in the next couple of days. And it is our hope that some of these changes that we can make outside the inviolable contract, particularly in the KTRS system, will save us enough money uh, that we won't have to make as deep a cuts in education when we do the budget later this session. And so this is a revised plan from the bill draft that was released and that had a 4.4 what billion dollar economic or impact fiscal impact over a course of 20 years. You think that's going to this one's going to be higher or lower or what's I'm, your anticipation? I'm going to wait till we see the score. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that these changes to things that are outside the inviolable contract uh, can can save significant dollars uh, but until the score comes out um, I'm really reluctant to to prognosticate what that will sure. be can you talk about the changes that were made from the draft form that had been discussed fairly heavily so the original bill which I thought was a good bill and a good solution it would have saved uh, a significant uh, amount of money going forward uh, that that has been watered down somewhat uh, I can speak in some generalities. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who has a defined benefit pension plan today will be able to keep that and work as long as they want to. There, there will be no more 27 years and then switch over to a 401 style plan. We believe that we could do that because the inviolable contract mentions the 27 years, uh, but with public sector input, 
uh, we've decided not to make that change. And then there are, there are other things that are outside the inviolable contract that, that we can look at, um, like uh, sick day spiking on a mm -hmm. going forward basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefit factor, the, the high three, mm -hmm. those are things that are, as noted by Bo Barnes of the Kentucky Teachers Retirement System, at a committee meeting this summer, uh, last summer, are outside the inviolable contract. The 3% uh, deduction, as it would be, for retiree health care costs, is that still a part of this newer version? It could be. It, it, could, it be. could be. So that's still a negotiable point. Could, yes. Health care for teachers is outside the inviolable contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, asking teachers to pay a little bit more for their health care if it saves us money that we would normally put in as a as a budget appropriation is something that we should consider mm -hmm. there there was some language in the bill now this was from the other draft about uh... if you return to public sector work in kentucky your pension would be suspended with the exception of gubernatorial appointees or elected officials is that language still a part of this new version Again, I don't, I don't want to talk about too Understood. many specifics, right. but in general, uh, after hearing from many in the public sector, uh, both on the employer and employee side, the rehiring after retirement issues will probably be changed mm -hmm. in the new bill. Mm -hmm. And you consider this a watered-down version? Absolutely. You would, you would have preferred the original uh, draft form yes, of this bill. I would have. But I'm, I'm about all about the possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get to yes. Uh, the House didn't have the votes to pass it, so you know we we had to come back and come up with something that. Uh, Does this have the votes to pass the House? I don't know. Well, yet. I don't know yet. Not, I, mean, yeah. you know, the, uh, I don't. I don't. I can't speak about the House. I, right. I think we could pass the bill in the Senate. We could have passed the original bill in the right. Senate, and I think that uh, anything that we come up with that puts us on a long-term path to sustainability and eliminates future risk for taxpayers and gets us immediate savings in the budget, I think that we can pass in the Senate. There had been criticism from some groups who had said that you could just stay the course with the level of funding that you have and not make structural changes and still pay down the unfunded liabilities in 20, 30 years' time. Will this approach really cut down on the unfunded liabilities in a way that you would hope and anticipate? Yes, I, I think I disagree with the defenders of the status quo, and I'm the, the sponsor of Senate Bill 2 from five years ago that changed CERS and KERS. Uh, I think that was a good bill. Obviously, I'm very proud of it, but it was the best we could get at the time. And I think now that the political dynamic has changed in this town, that we ought to be willing to make more changes. We ought to have the political courage to put self-interest aside, and I'm talking about political self-interest aside, and look to the long-term health of Kentucky's pension systems. And, and that means tough decisions for some. Many were particularly frightened by the recent news about the lawsuit against the hedge fund uh, manager, then that may be scary to some. So if, if there is a new system created that is a 401A, 401k style system, do you think that that lends credence to those fears that people have about management, investor, in, investors and, and the like about their fears of mismanagement and high fees, et cetera, et cetera? No, I, I think a 401a plan would bring more transparency to the table. And, and, and I am philosophically in favor of all new employees after July 1 going into a defined contribution benefit plan because I believe it's time that the risk on the taxpayers be removed. Mm -hmm. In a full defined benefit plan, all of the risk is on the employer, in this case, the taxpayers of Kentucky. A hybrid cash balance plan, which was adopted for all new employees after, after January 1 of 2014 in KERS and CERS, it's a shared risk. So the employee starts to share in the risk mm -hmm. with the employer, which in this case is state or local government, mm -hmm. the taxpayers. A defined contribution plan, all of the risk is borne by the employee, not the employer. And I think with the state that we are in right now, financially, and the fact that all private sector 
employees who have a pension are in a defined contribution plan. I believe philosophically going forward that after July 1, all new employees should go into a 401A style plan. And it's a pretty lucrative one, especially for teachers, because we've got to replace Social Security because teachers in Kentucky do not participate in Social Security. So it's an 18% contribution into the 401A style plan with the employee only putting up 4% of that. 12% would be put up by the state, 2% by the local school board for teachers, and then a 4% contribution by the employee. CERS uh, not separated? Separated? No. Which one? No, which way? There, no, separate. CERS separation is not part of the bill. Okay. I should have phrased that question a little bit more clear, so my apologies for that. Senator Bowen had said um, that there was a, a fine window for, of opportunity to pass a pension reform measure. He said a couple of weeks. You say maybe a month. If you get near the filing deadline, uh, the candidate filing deadline of January 30th, and there has not been a pension reform measure passed at that time, is it off the table this session? Well, I agree with Senator Bowen that it's a couple of weeks. And I, I know there are some people who are looking at the filing deadline. I am not among them. I believe we were elected to come up here and do a job and get to work on day one on doing that job. In the Senate, we are prepared to do that. Uh, our work has already begun and we will continue moving forward at a rapid pace on the bills that we have in our chamber. Um, I, I don't ever want to declare that pension reform is dead at any point because it is so critical. And the, the effects on the budget, if people think voting on a pension bill is tough, wait till a budget drops that could make a double digit cut to the SEEK funding formula for K-12 through education. Now that's a tough vote. Can, can you make a cut to the SEEK funding formula constitutionally? Yes. And that is a possibility? It's a probability. Probability. It's just a matter of uh, how, how big or small the cut will be. Pensions are the 800-pound gorilla in the budget. As you, as you noted, it's a tithe. 10% of the annual budget is needed on top of what we already put in. The unfunded liability, right now, every man, woman, and child in Kentucky is on the hook for $15,000 to pay it off. And I, you know, I hate to be Debbie Downer here, but this situation is dire. The chickens have come home to roost. Um, pinch is not the only thing on the table. Correct. There is a budget to craft, and we've talked about that because those are very connected. Um, but aside from the budget, there are other issues that probably are a part of the Senate Republican agenda. What are they? Well, obviously, the, uh, the budget and the road plan are mm -hmm. the other two biggies of the big three. Pensions, budget, road plan. What about tax reform? Because many people would say in order to really fund uh, government services and even help shore up the pension uh, situation that there needs to be some influx of new revenue. I don't think we're going to get the tax reform this session. And, and here, here's the thing, Renee. Any tax reform done this session would not kick in in terms of revenue mm -hmm. soon enough to really have an effect on this budget. Remember, Republicans are not for tax increases. We're for creating a tax code that is good for business to create and increase the number of jobs in Kentucky, which will eventually mean more tax revenue when you have more people working. That, that takes time for that to be implemented and to have an effect on the budget. I just think because we did not get pension reform done in a special session, and with the budget and the road plan looming, I, I, do, I just don't see us getting to tax reform this session. Now, I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. To predict on day one what might happen on day 50 or 55 or 60 uh, can be a bit folly. Uh, but I just don't see it happening. That, that could change. The temperature with your caucus, are they for or again tax reform? And, you know, tax reform takes many different approaches. And what is tax reform, we often say, and what does it look like? But on principle. No, our, our, our caucus in the Senate is very much interested in doing tax reform. I think they understand that our... Our tax code really doesn't fit the modern economy. I think it's going to take leadership from Governor Bevan 
on tax reform. And I, I also think we've got to get these other three big things done uh, before, before we can tackle it. And maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we can get it done in this regular session. But over the last six months, all of the talk has been about pensions. And changing the tax code is even more complicated. It affects more people. And I, I just want to try to lower expectations. I just don't see it being done this regular session. I reserve the right to change my mind. <laughs> of course. Uh, other issues. We know that there's a lot of talk. Uh, I had Senator Rocky Adams on with Adia Wishner and two House Democrats on Kentucky Tonight a few weeks back before the holidays to talk about health issues confronting the General Assembly. Medical marijuana came up. And there are bills. Uh, Senator Dan Syme and your caucus has a bill. Do you think this is the time for Kentucky lawmakers to evaluate the use of medicinal marijuana, whether that's end of life or other purposes, or even recreational marijuana, and as a source of revenue? I doubt it. Uh, I am not in support of recreational marijuana legalization in Kentucky. I know legislators in Colorado who have told me that it's not good or at 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 worst it's not good and that it's bad and at best the jury is still out. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded but not really in favor of moving forward on medicinal marijuana right now uh, because I don't think there's enough evidence and science out there. The other thing is, is I, I don't think we can smoke our way out of this pension problem. I don't think we can smoke, gamble, or tax our way mm -hmm. out of this pension problem. Gambling's off the table, too. I don't see much support for it. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, you're looking at the only yes. guy to ever get a constitutional amendment on expanded gambling right. to let the people decide to the floor of either chamber for a vote. Right, yeah. And I was it, make we, that point. we did that back in 2012, and right. been there, done that. I'm not really interested in going back. I still have the scars to prove that I, <laughs> I fought that battle. Yeah, you're done with that, right? Moving on. Criminal Justice 2.0, I'll call it. SB 120 enacted last year. We, we know that the CJ PAC. Uh, advisory committee on criminal justice issues has been working and, and has recommendations. Um, do you think that that's a possibility? And, and what have you heard or what do you understand about those measures that could be up for consideration? I don't know a lot of the specifics uh -huh. yet, but I do know that the Smart on Crime Coalition is working on more reforms. And we have passed a couple of bills in, in, in the past two sessions d dealing with those. Uh, S Senator Westerfield. Uh, we'll have uh, a lot of input there. So will Senator Rocky Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what the House sends us. But I think our caucus has an open mind on smart on crime initiatives as long as uh, it's, it's appropriate if we can save money uh, on the corrections front. But there, there's also a concern that despite the bills that we passed to try to tackle the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. we don't seem to be making any headway. So I think they want to make sure that we thread the needle carefully to make sure that we're not letting any bad guys back into the system, that we are appropriately punishing those uh, who are preying on, on the vulnerable with this heroin crisis, while at the same time looking to be smart uh, on crime in terms of the fiscal impact. And I think we, we've proven that on the expungement bill two mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. it came out of the House, it would have expunged like 800 or so right. felonies. We narrowed that down to a more manageable and realistic 50 or so. I, I think, you know, we, we want to try to find that balance because mm -hmm. it, it is an issue uh, that is important to the governor and important to the business community and does have some bipartisan support. So other than the big two or three, pension and the budget and the road plan, what do you want to see passed in the 2018 session? And, would you, and you would call a success on April 13th when you sign you die. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, three and three. The first three, of course, are, are, are pensions, right. the budget, and the road plan. The second three are constitutional amendments that were all filed by members of our caucus today. Uh, Senate Bill 2 was filed by Senator Ralph Alvarado, and that is a tort reform measure mm -hmm. that, if, if passed by the people of Kentucky, would allow the General Assembly to set caps on non-economic damages. We feel like this is something we've worked on for 15 years to try to bring down the escalating cost of health care. Senate Bill 3, sponsored by Senator Whitney Westerfield, is our Marcy's Law mm -hmm. constitutional amendment that we have passed in the, in the past. And it would provide more constitutional rights 
for crime victims. Yeah, crime victims bill of rights as we often heard it referred Correct. to. Correct, and it's recently passed in Ohio and mm -hmm. several other states and it's building momentum around the country. And then Senate Bill 4, sponsored by Senator Chris McDaniel, is another one that we've passed before that would move statewide constitutional elections to presidential election years. Mm -hmm. uh, we polled that and it has 83% support across all political parties and political ideologies. What's the rationale or justification for such a move? There are multiple. Uh, number one, it would save governments, primarily local governments, counties, which bear the cost of elections primarily on, on their budgets. It would save the counties millions of dollars. Uh, it, would, it would require then that we have elections two out of every four years instead of three out of every four years. And I think Kentuckians mm -hmm. like that idea. Also, there's a civic engagement argument. We, we only have about 30% of the uh, electorate selecting who the governor is and the agriculture commissioner and the attorney general. If you move that to a presidential election year, you pretty much double the number of people who are engaged in the election and deciding who's going to lead our state government at the executive branch level. And I think, you know, people talk about voter engagement and trying to get mm -hmm. more, uh, more people to vote and higher voter turnout. The number one thing that we can do is to move the elections of our statewide officers to a presidential election year, and you'll, you'll have more people engaged automatically. And now, if that, if that passed the General Assembly and then was voted uh, favorably by the people in 2018, it means that those running for office in 2019 would have a five-year term, and, and they would serve until 2024. And the subsequent statewide elections would take place that year instead of 2023. And there's precedent for this. Uh, back in the early 1990s, uh, the election year for county officials was, mo would, was moved. And I believe that everyone elected in 1993 got a five-year mm -hmm. term and then didn't have to run again until 1998. There are some who say if you really want to improve voter engagement and voter participation that you will also allow for in-person early voting. That's been pushed by the Secretary of State, and, and uh, we know that the Tennessee Secretary of State is uh, supportive of that measure. Tennessee has done that. What are your thoughts about that? I am unalterably opposed to early voting. Uh, I think that Election Day should be sacrosanct, and campaigns are meant to peak on Election Day, and I also think that there are many states uh, where there is early voting, where there has been rampant election fraud. And in some cases, elections are over before Election Day. And I, I don't think that is very good for our republic, uh, for, for our form of government. And I think that uh, the, 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 the way we have our absentee voting right now, and we made some tweaks to that two years ago, I think those are appropriate when, when you've got an excuse for in-person absentee voting. But I'm, I'm not ever going to be for going to full-on early voting. You mentioned the constitutional amendments that uh, your caucus is behind. What about a constitutional amendment for automatic voting rights restoration for certain felons? Uh, I'm, I'm not for that, although in the past I have been in support of an amendment uh, that would uh, allow for a reasonable waiting period. Mm -hmm. You know, the recidivism rate is about 33 percent after three years. I think a reasonable three to five year waiting period after someone serves their sentence if they if they don't commit another felony that we could go to uh, a process that would allow for the automatic restoration of voting rights but the the pro felon restoration folks don't want that they want all the loaf right now if they'd be willing to take half a loaf uh, I would potentially consider it but I don't I don't see much support in the Senate right now for full automatic restoration of felon voting rights. Uh, this is 2017 uh, was a challenging year for the Kentucky legislature and and we've seen some house action before our interview with you about uh, Speaker Hoover and action there. How much are those dynamics going to affect the effectiveness of the whole entire legislature and what you can produce? It's a good question. I'm, I'm concerned about it. Um, time will tell. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, they can get to work right away uh, on, a, on a pension bill. The Senate is prepared to lead and, and we will continue doing what the Senate always does and we, we will move forward and uh, 
uh, a pretty rapid fashion. You're going to start to see committee hearings on bills next week. We're going to deal with uh, some confirmations of gubernatorial appointments, as is mm -hmm. our constitutional right and responsibility. And you know we're prepared to work with the House leadership. And I'm hopeful that uh, this episode uh, can be put in the rearview mirror quickly so we can do the work of the people that we were elected to do. We know that there is some fraction friction between uh, the first floor <coughs> governor's office and some House Republicans. What's the relationship with uh, your brethren and sister in down the hall? Sort of like the middle sibling. <laughs> Leave it at that, huh? To quote Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Well. We have a great working relationship with Governor Bevan and his team. And we have a great working relationship with Speaker Osborne and his team. And the Senate is prepared to do the people's work during this session of the General Assembly. Yeah. Anything else you care to add, Leader? Well, I, I'm, I'm just happy to be back. You know, I want to wish everyone a happy new year. Your this, 15th year. My, this is my 15th year. I was elected January 28, mm -hmm. uh, 2003, and it's an honor and a privilege to serve. I uh, note that this is the earliest that the General Assembly can start by the right. Constitution. We start the first Tuesday after the first Monday. And Next this year, happened to fall right after New Year's Right Day. after New Year's. Next year, we don't start until January 8. Yes. Uh, but we're ready to go. You know, some people like to grumble and complain about the legislature being back in session, I'm always happy to be here because I feel like this is the essence of why we run for office during this 60-day period. There is work that we do throughout the year, but it all culminates during the legislative session. And I'm happy to be here. Our caucus is happy to be here, and the Senate is ready to get to work. Yeah. Best of luck to you. We appreciate you, Leader Thayer. Thank you. Appreciate the work that KET does. Yeah.